All right, hi. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me here at Tech Field Day. Um, I'm going to cover um, an overview. I'm going to start with Cisco's Enterprise NFV end to end virtualization strategy. It's an overview. Um, I'm going to try to set the context for my colleagues. You'll be hearing from Miles Davis and um, Matt Faulkner later on. But if you do have any questions, let me know. I'll try to answer them as we go. And then on one of these uh, strategies, I'm going to double click. This is uh, what Cisco is doing within public cloud. Okay. So my name is Tony Banuelos. I'm a product manager within Cisco. Um, and what we're going to touch on is what the end-to-end -end solution is and what we're trying to achieve with virtualization to enable uh, customers, businesses to basically de uh, launch uh, certain network services on demand, right? So if we start off with the virtualization of the branch and why you would want to do it. So today, um, you know, about 80% of businesses is done off of the uh, branch office. Um, users are always changing the types of tools that they, that they need to do business. So your uh, networking and security policies need to change on demand. So what better way to do it than with virtualization where your network functions are now just software. You have a platform that you lay down at your branch office um, and all your functions like routing, security, uh, uh, wireless LAN controllers, uh, WAN optimization is all just software that you can just launch and deploy when you need it. Similarly, we're working uh, with service providers um, on this type of uh, solution where they're now, ho they would be managing the service, hosting these services, bringing the intelligence of the network to their POP, and then extending that out to uh, a customer uh, branch office or, or customer premise, um, where they, the customer at that point would just have a simple thin CP that we would call something that just does layer three or layer two extension, right? But the intelligence would be on the service provider. I'm not gonna touch too much on detail on that one, but it's general architecture that I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, similarly, again, data center services, being able to virtualize those networking functions that you require, do it at scale. So Cisco offers VNFs that can perform down to from 10 megabits per second all the way to 10 gigs, right? And then there's another trend that we're seeing uh, with a lot of our enterprise customers. Uh, where they are trying to, right, these customers are moving their applications to cloud. And what they want to do is they want to have that um, performance into cloud, uh, be able to tie into those cloud providers securely and extend the routing fabric to the edge of that cloud provider. Similarly then, once you're inside that public cloud provider, you have these applications running inside, let's say, AWS, Azure, um, most of our, uh, of our customers, how, uh, uh, how their uh, organizations are working is they have these BUs that they've already started testing on AWS. They started migrating applications to AWS. So a lot of our customers end up with cross regions, different accounts. So how do you tie all that in together? And that's why we offer Cisco's VNFs on AWS and Azure as well. So you can build those uh, networks and extend your enterprise network from on-prem colo into public cloud, right? So we'll go through that. So uh, what does virtualization help with? One is flexibility. Again, going back to provisioning services on demand when you need them, right? Um, if a user needs to tomorrow have access to Azure and you need to implement a connection to Azure, it's now a, a network service that you can deploy uh, as a software and bring it up uh, when it's needed. Also, it's going to help you with speed of, uh, of services. Again, it's software, right? The, the, the main thing here is that we're moving to, a, to a, 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 a static platform that you're able to scale out, uh, bring up VNFs as you need them, and deploying when you need them, right? You don't have to have that truck roll. You don't have to have that hard, new hardware appliance shipped out to deliver that new function. It's actually software that you orchestrate from a central site and provision it on demand. Um, so today, about 83% of uh, IT budget is simply main, uh, is to maintain the status quo of the network. Uh, with virtualization, you can reduce all that cost. Uh, uh, about 70% uh, is uh, some of the savings that we've seen with some customers. Again, being able to uh, not have to do those truck rolls when you need to provision a new, a new service within those branch offices or, uh, or even a campus site. So let's uh, look a little deeper on what our solution is for vBranch. Um, its components are going to be, obviously, you need a central orchestration layer 
Uh, this is going to be built upon our APIC EM, our uh, ESA, or for our service providers, there's a network services uh, orchestrator or NSO, right? So uh, APIC EM really delivering on uh, the fact that you can provision these services without any, any uh, remote expertise at the branch office, right? We have the plug and play. So you send the box that's already pre-provisioned in ESA. Uh, you create a, a profile of that, of that um, location, right? Uh, the box gets there. You just need a person that knows how to plug in a, an Ethernet cable, uh, WAN, LAN, and then a power cord and power it up. Once that device is up, um, there's going to be a DHCP option 43 that's going to be obtained. It's going to go find its APIC EM controller, register itself, and then now it's ready to be provisioned, right? You start uh, deploying all the networks to serve, uh, network services that you need. Uh, the other piece that's important here is the rich network services, right? Cisco is aiming at supporting all of its networking services, whether that's routing, whether that's uh, firewall uh, security, whether that's WAN optimization, whether that's wireless. We're going to have a hardware appliance, and we're going to have a software appliance, a virtual form factor of that, of that service, right? And not only that, but uh, later on, Matt will be uh, talking about our openness on this platform. So if you needed to support a third-party vendor, uh, maybe it's uh, a competitor of ours. We will support it as long as they support a KVM. And that brings me into our software intelligence layer. So our virtualization layer is our, our Cisco NFVIS. It's a virtualized, uh, virtualization uh, hypervisor, very uh, tailored for networking services. Uh, that's not to say that you wouldn't be able to also consolidate applications like simple uh, a lot of these branch offices need AD, print services type of applications. So you would be also uh, able to run those uh, on this hypervisor, which is Linux KVM. So as long as the vendor supports a Linux KVM flavor of their services, we would be able to, to support it on this platform. This is something I kind of struggle with understanding where the line is. Yeah. I think a previous slide said uh, any service virtualized anywhere on any platform. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you, you heard Peter Jones speak earlier about custom ASICs and the value in hardware. Yes. So when you have something like, you know, the ECNS 5400 platform where you can take an entire branch office and do pretty much everything on yeah. x86, right. where, where do you want to see services virtualized? versus where do you want to leverage the value in the custom ASICs? Like, where is that line? The value on the custom ASICs is obviously in the performance. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a limit to what you can do, right, when you start virtualizing and leveraging x86. There's technologies within x86 that can help you move the performance up, things like SRIOV to do a hardware acceleration on your network I.O. But obviously when we're talking about uh, performance and aggregation sites, uh, where you're looking at 40 gig, 60 gig, 80 gig, uh, those ASICs are, are going to help you offload that and, 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 and get you to performance that you need. So do you see the NFE right now as being more of a branch office technology? It's not only branch office. There's use cases also for your, for your um, colo. And I'll touch upon on the colo piece um, a, a little bit, and then uh, Miles will, will cover it in detail. Uh, but again, it goes back to uh, where you need the performance and where you need the robustness of a, of a, of a dedicated appliance, right? To where, uh, and then uh, behind, it could be that behind that, you have where you want to instantiate services for, for, uh, for your employees or customers or partners. So it could be that you're aggregating connectivity into a, into a site. It could be a data center, it could be a colo. And then behind that, you have a rack of servers where you're instantiating services for different types of use cases. Gotcha. Um, and that, again, that takes me back to the, um, the other piece that, that's here is platform freedom of choice, right? So the NFVIS virtualization layer being a, uh, available today on the uh, Cisco UCS E-Series server. So if you're familiar with our ISR 4000s, uh, they have a blade, uh, uh, a compartment where you can slip in a blade, right? That blade is uh, x86. So the customer would have a hardened ISR 4K, uh, to your point, uh, dedicated to do the WAN uh, termination, they're used to they're used to the iOS XC running there. That's what they're comfortable with. But they also see value in virtualization. They want to virtualize some of the other functions needed at that branch. So you lay out lay down NFEIS, fully uh, auto discoverable, and once it's discoverable, you can uh, launch uh, new services like wireless, like uh, firewall or WAN optimization, for example.
The next topic um, that I'll touch on is the colo. Okay, and this is a, a trend again that we're seeing with a large enterprise doing. So today, uh, or normally what they would have is they would have a private data center where they were hosting all of their applications. But of course, um, along came Azure, along came uh, AWS, and other cloud services that they can leverage, right? And they have been moving their applications up to those cloud providers. So now, if let's take a, the, uh, an example of a financial, where they have their own employees, separate branch offices. They also have customers trying to log into their accounts and trying to use their, their services. And then they have partners, maybe a, a large retail that's having like a million credit card transactions a day. They now have to provide connectivity to all these different uh, personas you can say, right, or, 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 or profiles of, of people that are accessing their services. So now, how do they tie in access into Azure, into AWS, and into their own private data center between the applications that are now have to communicate between each other, right? So what if you bring up the DMZ closer to the cloud providers using a carrier neutral facility like Equinix, and you create a connectivity between your, your uh, different um, customers or consumers of services, and you are the provider bringing that a network fabric into the colo itself, right? So that's our Cisco uh, Secure Agile Exchange solution. So basically, uh, the components are built on Nexus 9K switching fabric, and then our CSP 2100 compute platforms that are running NFEIS. These have the capability to cluster and scale out, so you start with a set of servers. As your uh, requirements grow, if you need uh, more compute to, to offer more services, you just add a stack of, of servers to, to that cluster, right? Um, and what's best is now you have direct connectivity into these cloud providers because it's basically literally from a cage to another cage to connect to AWS's uh, Direct Connect. Similarly, you take another wire from your cage to Azure's cage, and now you have Express Route. Um, if that big retail uh, customer of yours has a cage in the Equinix colo, you just bring them in directly into your cage and, and, and create that connection. And now you have also your branch offices coming in, whether those are dedicated MPLS or maybe even internet. Uh, you have your cust uh, customers coming in through that and then redirect them to their web uh, portal and then that redirects uh, access to your uh, sensitive information down in your data center. That's just Equinix? Uh, today our partner is Equinix, but it could, it, I mean, it could be another colo. There's no, there's no uh, marriage to, to, to the Equinix, yeah. Um, there's a benefit to Equinix, though, because they have uh, the Cloud Exchange service. So it's basically a service portal. So if you think about what I just mentioned, right, having these direct connectivities between uh, your cage and their cage, um, you still have, you'd have to manage that and figure out that how does that operate with AWS? How does that operate with Azure? How does that operate with other cloud providers, right? But uh, with Equinix, they have the cloud exchange, or uh, they call it their um, international business exchange, where you hand a cable to them, and they have this network fabric now that is uh, serviced by a portal that you then you are able to order what services you want from each one of those cloud providers. So now it's a matter of just saying, I need AWS and you click uh, through their portal, click I need AWS, and they do the service chaining for you. So click, 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 and that cable is now plugged into AWS. They, they, take, it, they take care of it. That's pretty neat. Yeah. yeah. So any questions on, on, on this one? Okay, I'll move, move ahead. The next topic is um, public cloud and what we're doing in public cloud, right? So we're off, we offer a gamut of Cisco VNFs. So I'm gonna um, double click a little bit on the use case of CSR 1000V because um, as you heard me say, you, you, bring, you bring the DMZ to the colo, and, you're, and you now are able to manage the connectivity of your different consumers and how you lay out the different access that they should have into your applications. Now, if you recall what I said around public cloud, most of these customers have, you know, have um, users that are already consuming services from the cloud. They have different accounts. They're running on different regions. The networking services that are on Amazon, Azure, and, uh, and other these, uh, these other cloud providers, uh, they're good enough to give you some security level, good enough to create an IPsec tunnel, 
but they're very limited as to when it comes to advanced enterprise features that you really need to actually create a, perim a secure perimeter around your applications. There's no reason why your security and routing requirements which should change between hosting in your private data center to now public cloud. Right, so for us, by extending that CSR 1000V, it gives you that edge device that you now have access to enterprise level uh, uh, features. Things like DMVPN and just making that, that uh, Azure or AWS cloud look like another spoke or hub uh, to your network being able to have telemetry with AVC, being able to tell what's happening, being able to test uh, with IPSLA, figure out what are, what, are the, what are the situations if something's failing. Um, and also traffic shaping, which is a, a big, uh, big uh, to-do within public cloud because uh, if you're oversubscribing pipes, how do you make sure that you're not dropping uh, control packets off of an of IPsec tunnel, right? 